Isaac Newton envisioned a universe where planets, stars, and falling apples were all governed by the same laws. However, breakthroughs in technology and particle physics during the 20th century have revealed that Newton's simple model no longer fits when we break the universe down to its subatomic parts. Moreover, quantum physics has taught us that matter is less solid and definable than it appears. Newton may have been surprised by the idea that his apple might not even have existed, but this concept of an ephemeral universe is not new. As long ago as 150 to 250 CE, the Indian philosopher Nagarjuna described a similar idea when he taught the doctrine of the two truths. One truth, asserting that all things are universally relative, conventionally true, and the other, that all things are impermanent, and thus sunya are empty, the true nature of all things, the real truth behind the universe. The purpose of this paper is to explore these points where Buddhism and science come together by addressing their respective theories concerning the true nature of space, time, matter, and methods of analysis. When this is done, it seems that there is less of an overlap occurring between these body, two bodies of thought, with drastically separate origins, and more of an image of two separate accounts of an intricate universe described in the same ways. A comparison of the Buddhist concept of reality being hollow or empty, and quantum foam is a fruitful place to begin our analysis because these are core concepts of Buddhism and physics that address the universe broadly. The idea of the Buddhist bubble is well visualized through a comparison to Hinduism, although this comparison will have to be slightly generalized for both Hinduism and Buddhism are both extremely wide-ranging entities consisting of several schools of thought. It works well. Hinduism is similar to Buddhism in that they both believe in reincarnation, that there are many multiple paths to enlightenment, and that suffering is caused by attachment. One difference found in Hinduism is that many Hindus worship a variety of deities and also place belief in Atman and Brahman, the individual soul and the supreme creator, respectively. Hindu also believes in the supremacy of the Vedas, Hindu scripture, the Buddha did not place emphasis on these objective concepts, but rejected all concepts of Atman, emphasizing not permanence, but changeability. Furthermore, Buddhists do not believe in existence of souls as well as in the first cause, or a god. The Buddhist self is formless and empty, like a bubble. This idea is further explained by the Dalai Lama in saying that most people believe that there is a core to our being, as well as an objective reality, but to possess such independent, intrinsic existence would imply that things and events are somehow complete unto themselves, and that, that therefore entirely self-contained. This would mean that nothing has the capacity to interact with and exert influence on other phenomena. In 1955, John Wheeler derived the breakthrough concept of quantum foam. This theory asserts that space-time is not smooth like was originally thought, but instead is convoluted by foam, or subatomic particles that are constantly being created and destroyed at the Planck length scale. Wheeler gives an accurate visualization of the minuteness of the Planck length scale, saying that the number of Planck lengths it would take to span a proton is comparable to the number of protons it would take to span New Jersey. While Buddhist foam is a concept of emptiness, quantum foam is an image of a subatomic universe in constant flux. It can be described as an illustration of the Buddhist impermanence and interconnectedness that are the root of emptiness, occurring at the simplest level. Here, the idea of independent existence clearly does not exist, as all matter is revealed to be the same thing, energy. Subatomic reactions are no more than energy interacting with other bits of energy. In other words, matter is a series of patterns out of focus. The search for the ultimate stuff of the universe ends with the discovery that there isn't any.
the Sarvastivada, were an early school of Buddhism that spoke of the basic constituent pieces of matter, saying that the universe was reducible to various elements. Although Nargarjuna was critical of the Sarvastivada, it was his follower Vasubandhu, 316 to 396 CE, the brother of Asanga, who popularized the Sarvastivada view in his text, the Abhidharma Kosha, our treasury of higher knowledge. In this text, Vasubandhu argues against the existence of independent, indivisible atoms. His argument follows that if we were to take one atom and surround it on all sides by six more atoms, four in each direction, and one on the top and bottom, would the same part on the central atom that touches the eastern atom be the same part that touches the northern atom? If not, then the atom must have more than one part and is thus divisible. If it does, then it must be touching all the remaining atoms in the same manner and would have to be collapsed into one big atom, which does not make sense. Because of this, Vasubandhu argues, atoms have to be infinitely divisible, and so there cannot be such a thing as solid, independently existing atoms. With this view in mind, the universe then is essentially made up of little bits of nothing. Modern-day experiments with particle accelerators try to do what Vasubandhu could, not, could only visualize. Conversely, the original purpose of particle physics was not to prove particles infinitely divisible, but to discover the ultimate building blocks of the universe by repeatedly dividing particles until the smallest indivisible units were discovered. Particle accelerators do provide a method to do basic research on the composition of matter, but not in the manner that was originally thought. The experiment was designed to break a particle apart by smashing it into another at a very high speed. However, when two particles are smashed together, the result is not pieces of a broken particle, as one would think, but instead, new forms of matter are produced that would not exist under normal conditions. Confusingly, matter is generated. Einstein's theory of relativity goes far in explaining what happens. It is the tremendous amount of kinetic energy necessary to project the projectile particle combined with the mass of both the original particles that generates the new ones. This is essentially proof that mass and energy are the same thing. The Dalai Lama helps to explain the confusion in saying that we falsely believe that intrinsically real seeds produce intrinsically real crops at an intrinsically real time in an intrinsically real place. Each member of this causal nexus, the seed, time, place, and effect we take to have solid, ontological status. However, at what point does the seed become the crop? Where does one come it from and the other go? It is a puzzle whose resolution involves the intermeshing of time, mass, and energy, as the theory of relativity does. <laughs>